<laughs> you guys are all still here? <laughs> Sorry about that. So, my name is Kevin McPeak, uh, and I'll be your speaker for the next 45 minutes. Uh, I'm, I'm here to talk to you about wireless war roaming. Uh, can I see uh, hands of people who've gone war roaming before? Uh, who does it with passion? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I've been just a bit of history. I, I actually got inspired originally. At, I think it was DevCon two two thousand and three or two thousand and four, and I wasn't uploading to Wiggle. Does everyone know what Wiggle is? No. Yeah. Wiggle is the wireless uh, in, uh, geographical location engine. Uh, so if you've gone war roaming with wi looking for Wi-Fi, um, using something like Kesmet or the Wiggle app, uh, which they have for Android phones, uh, Wiggle is the one of the largest online uh, repositories where you can upload all your Wi-Fi data, uh, the war roams that you've made, and, and get some sort of idea like um, where have you been, it puts it all on a map for you, uh, you can see how other people have been war roaming. Uh, you can actually join teams on Wiggle. And uh, I've been doing this for, since, I was doing it anonymously since around 2003, 2004, and 2011. I actually joined up. And what I'm here to talk to you about today is you can uh, basically spend a lot of time going methodically back and forth, up and down your streets, which I've done, and I'm going to tell you about that. Uh, but I'm really here to talk to you about, like, if you're, if you're somebody who's passionate about this, but you find it's been taking too much of your time, so you can't get into it, I'm going to give you a few tips on what you can do about this. Um, so yeah, this was my intro, and basically, yeah, uh, I'm going, this is very interesting, because if you see here, these are all VSS IDs I've all picked up, uh, and I've mapped out, and that's approximately about where they are. But I've never been war roaming down here. I'm going to tell you how I got all these BSSDs from The Hague. Uh, so yeah, so who am I? Well, these are a few of the nicknames I go by. Uh, Cowboy is sort of, if you go to Hack in the Box, DEF CON, you'll hear this. It's one of my popular nicknames. Cryptodendron is something that uh, is in a, a nickname from a different area. Rusu Rupus is what I actually am registered on Wiggle as. And I get a lot of questions, what is Rasu Rupus? If you've been into Linux administration, super user backwards. <laughs> so just a little bit of bio about myself. I've been in security. Uh, it was sort of an accidental start in the security. I was a developer. It was uh, for the first few couple of years of my career. I was programming credit card terminals. And back then, I made my first vulnerability exposure. It was a backdoor in the Trans 330. Uh, I filed it. In 1991, and uh, back then we'd even call it a vulnerability report because <laughs> I didn't know what they were called, but I found a back door in the Trans 330 credit card terminal, uh, which you could dial in and, and dump all the contents, of, including the program of these terminals, and modify it, re-upload it to the credit card terminal. Uh, I've been involved in geolocation in some way, shape, or form for most of this time. 1991, I started a company called Location Data Systems, and it was actually done to, to remotely monitor cell site two-way radio towers in the United States. And so I've been, one way or the other, I've been like triangulating GSM towers, whether for work or, or my 15 years at Toco, and just for fun, I've, I've actually now gotten into it. This is just a quick, because this is a Unix Group. I thought I'd mention a little bit about my Linux addiction, and the reason why, to me, this is very special is because 25 years ago this year, I downloaded my first install of Linux, it was Slapper Linux, and I downloaded it in Rotterdam, even though I'm from Texas, downloaded it in Rotterdam and tried to install it on a little Toshiba 486SX computer. Uh, it was very frustrating. <laughs> that was in 1993, and I think, I'm pretty sure I downloaded it from NLUUG's FTP servers. <laughs> so I thought it's nice that I'm coming to speak at NLUUG for 25 years later. Uh, this is, I was telling somebody else, this is my aquarium controller. The screen here, you're looking on this. 
Uh, I actually I grow corals and, and breed seahorses and, and Nemo fish and, and, and sell some of this stuff. Uh, and to do all of this, I'm running it on various raspberries. It's actually a cluster of raspberry pies. This was the initial one, which was a raspberry model one, raspberry pie model one. Uh, but it's all now on raspberry uh, model threes. Uh, but this basically takes care of 1,500 liters of marine water in my living room and even changes the water on the system by itself. So I don't have to do any of that. Uh, Linux also empowers my photography. If you know, I have a, a, a website called Hogs of Feet Chic. It's on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and I take pictures of cyclists around the Netherlands. And this is sort of some of my thing. Oh yeah, the, the reason why Linux powers everything from the 40 terabyte server that I store all my pictures on to my camera, and that's X11 running on my Samsung NX1 camera. <laughs> <laughs> But really what I'm here to talk to you about is war roaming and Linux powers and powering my war roaming activities uh, for a very, very long time. This is, this is what I used to use a long time ago just for a mobile device. Anyone familiar with the Nokia internet tablets? These were awesome little computers and the Wi-Fi was really kick-ass on the N800. Uh, this was my, my, from 2011 I started a very aggressive campaign. And this is more what I used. I used the old Toshiba laptop that was recycled from a garbage can from the company Orange that was being thrown out when T-Mobile bought us. I recovered that and three battery packs so I could war run with it. And I had between three to five antennas all stuck in my backpack. I had a modified backpack to keep the laptop cool while I'm cycling for three to five hours at a time. And uh, later I ended up saying that this is way too heavy. Uh, it sucked when it rained because I, I couldn't get it wet. So I ended up building these devices, which you see here in front on the table here. So why stumble? Why war road? Well, why plane spot? Why train spot? Um, and one of the things I always get questions like, is that illegal? Are you going to be able to continue it when the new privacy legislation comes into effect? Uh, I think so. <laughs> I don't see why not. Um, in fact, I think Apple and Google will have more problems do, doing this than I will. If you're not aware, you're, if you have a smartphone, a modern smartphone, you're actually already war running. Except you're doing it on behalf of Google and Apple. Uh, every few minutes they take a Wi-Fi snapshot wherever your phone is if you have Wi-Fi on, and it will snapshot all the SSIDs it can see and send them back up to their servers so they can do geolocation by Wi-Fi over the network. Uh, I'm doing basically the same thing. It's just not, rather than doing a snapshot every couple of minutes, I'm looking every second, half second, and I'm just collecting hordes of data. Um, I'm not actually breaking, and just to be clear, I'm not breaking into anybody's network. Uh, I don't do that. I don't, I don't, I actually don't fraud. Typically, unless I'm hired, I don't capture PCAPs. Uh, because it's, um, or unless there's, unless there's, there really has to be a need, collecting PCAPs is interesting, but I would say, um, yeah, be respectful to most people. <laughs> you, if you don't need it, don't collect it. Uh, uh, so yeah, so why actually do this? There's a lot of things that you can, you can discover from, from war roaming. Uh, war roaming can be static. You saw a picture of airplanes on the previous screen. I have an ADS-B and uh, Raspberry Pi with an SDR that's in my attic, and I'm actually watching, just like Flight Radar 24 or something like this, I'm watching directly from the attic of my house, and I do it because my wife and I like to sit up in the evenings and watch the sunset. She likes to watch the sunset. I like to watch the airplanes because my dad was a pilot instructor. And I'm always like, you know, what kind of plane is that? You know, so I, I like to see what altitude, what speed, where is it going, what airlines. So for me, it's just kind of a, a fun curiosity. But there's a lot of other good reasons on why, 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 why to do this. You can quite often discover, and I've, even though I consider myself somewhat of an experienced security guy, most experienced security people know they make mistakes too, and I've certainly sat there, been war roaming around the neighborhood, got back to my house and went, oh shit, <laughs> I need to go change my access point. I forgot I made that change a while back. 
Uh, so you can find vulnerabilities about your own network. You can find vulnerabilities about your neighbor's network. I would say be responsible there, be ethical. Uh, I've certainly found uh, some, a couple of my neighbors, Wi-Fi, they know I'm in security. I've gone over and knocked on the door and said, hey, you know, your network's actually exposed. And they're like, thank you very much. I didn't know. I don't know how it got that way. Uh, also interesting, and just for fun, some kicks, uh, the, uh, my, home, my home controller that you saw also manages my query, also is doing a bit of this on Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. And uh, it's actually sort of something I've been playing around with, trying to create how to create sort of an ethical profiling system using Wi-Fi and wireless. Yeah, so it's, it's a difficult challenge. We've been, we've, me and another guy have been kicking this around for a long time because we were also thinking about how can you leverage it in an ethical way for law enforcement for really cases that need it, but yet protect the interest of the citizens. And that's something I'm very... I'm very strong on that camp, so that's why it's kind of kept us from developing something here. But you can have a lot of fun with it. You can certainly, like I told my wife the other day, oh, we have some new neighbors that moved in. She said, how did you know? And she said, so I saw their TV. <laughs> <laughs> they have a, a nice new Samsung TV that they got, and some other equipment, and they just all appeared. It all came on in one day. So and they're, they're right next door to us, uh, the center of the egg, so it was really easy to pick their, their network up. Uh, but it's also interesting because it's uh, in this day of Internet of uh, Things and whatnot, appliances, smart appliances, we're seeing more and more uh, ways that you could per perhaps uh, case or profile a house for physical theft because you don't actually need to get on the network to see the MAC addresses when you're doing any of this. And so you can literally just go down the MAC addresses if you've got... Um, the correct database installed on, on your system, it will just already in Kismet tell you what model it is. A little bit further digging, you can find out actually, some, in some cases, the per particular appliance and what revision it was. And that gets a little scary because literally you could, I haven't done this, but you could go through and just create something that automatically enumerates all of this in great detail. It would just give you a nice, spit out a nice report saying, hey, this house has this, this house has this, and you could just say, hey, we're going to rob this one. So for me, that's even as somebody who's involved in the bureaucracy um, of my neighborhood, it's something I've tried to raise to tell other people, be careful. I have a lot of Wi-Fi network. I have a lot of smart appliances on my network. But it's something we think, oh, OK, does this need to be on there? Does that? Do we really need that? Does the trade benefit, the convenience benefit really pay off? And, and doing some of this raises the attention when I go to my neighbors and say, hey, I saw you got a new TV. How did you know? Well, I tell them, and then they're like, they go over and take the Ethernet cable out of the TV after that. Your Wi Fi's still on. <laughs> um, so, yeah, why, why to do this? Openly share a lot of information. Um, just like with lock picking, which is something else I'm also into, uh, I find that there's a lot of positive things for doing this. A lot of, of good reasons why to do this. And more importantly, you can actually make some money. This is one, one area that I was telling a few people here today. I'm actually, for 10 years inside uh, T-Mobile and Orange, I was specialized in forensics. Uh, it's more on the computer side, but occasionally we did wireless forensics as well. And since I've gone freelance, this is an area that I really want to focus in on more and more. And I'm working on a, a, a wireless or GSM forensics case right this minute uh, for a customer of mine. Um, so I think that this is, it's also interesting for security assessments and privacy awarenesses. Um, I actually got started uh, professionally in, in a way, uh, it was actually in 2002, was my first wireless assessment at Dutch Tone. Uh, I didn't really know how to do it. I was told, if you don't know how to do it, get somebody here fast. And so we hired a uh, common friend of ours. Uh, hired them, they came over and they ran around waving this thing and I was just like, I got to figure out how I've seen this at DEF CON and now I've got to hire people to do this, I want to figure out how to do all this myself. So I've been doing this, that's really where I kind of got my inspiration for doing this. Um, in 2011, uh, around 2010, 2011, we had a change in the Wi-Fi specification. Uh, there was a addendum for mobile devices and they changed the way Wi-Fi works in a nutshell, and I'm going to greatly summarize it here, 
But in short, to, in order to save battery life on these types of devices, uh, the old spec before 2010 would have killed the batteries on these. So the way that they, the, the spec has been modified now is that your mobile phone, typically when you leave Wi-Fi on, if the radio only comes on for a split second, and it will call out for half a dozen DSSIDs that it's last seen, and then go back to sleep if it doesn't see any. And, and, and this is a way for it to, they actually figured out it was easier on the battery to transmit a quick burst than to stay in receive mode for long periods of time. So they reversed the way that the Wi-Fi protocol works. And in 2011, I, I recognized the shift because I was at T-Mobile at the time, and we had a lot of Wi-Fi in our network, and I started to realize it's a bit of a privacy issue. And at this point, I started thinking about, well, how can you profile somebody with this if it's spitting out the last five or 10 SSIDs, that's got to be a bit of a privacy leak. And then, so I set up uh, basically a, a larger version. Hey, the picture of the laptop you saw in the office place, that's, I left that running for 24-7 for a couple of months and, and started trying to build a little database of all my fellow colleagues and whatnot. Then around this time, as I'm getting really into it, somebody shows up at DEF CON and does the same talk I'm thinking about. So it's like, ah, <laughs> didn't, I missed that opportunity. But the issue is still there. The issue is still there, and it's something that we need to think about because if, you, if you've been perhaps someplace maybe you don't want anyone to know and you've used the Wi-Fi at that place, uh, your phone's going to leak this information out. And it very conceivably, what we found out, we could tell our seat when I was doing this at T-Mobile as a research product, I could tell which colleagues were going out using the Wi-Fi at, at McDonald's. Uh, I could tell if they'd been there that morning. Uh, because their mobile, in the morning, their, their handset would look for that SSID first. So that told me if they were just there that morning. They'd probably been there a previous visit, used the Wi-Fi, and then forgot about it, but their phone remembered it. When they were at McDonald's, it logged on again. So now, when they got to the office, they arrive at the office, and the first one it reaches out is not instead of being at the bottom of the list, it's at the top. And I now know they went to McDonald's that morning. So you could start, we realized we could start really profiling the director of our company this way, which was a little bit nervous for him when I informed him. <laughs> I don't know why I got so nervous. <laughs> um, but it's, it's something to think about. Um, so from an awareness tool, that's, that's definitely value there. Um, these are some of the tools you can use, although I'll be speaking mostly about Wi-Fi today. Um, you can also warm room Uber t uh, Bluetooth using an Uber Tooth adapter. Um, GSM radios, a lot of people are already familiar by running the Wiggle app or what is it, SSA Analyzer, I think it is, where uh, it's a specific GSM app that you can get for Android. And it will sit there, and as you're driving down the road, it will actually enumerate all the cell IDs for a given network that you have a SIM card for. Or in some cases, you can take the SIM out of your phone, and it will be able to see all the, the cell IDs. Uh, and this also works for the Wiggle app. You can take the SIM out of some mobile phones, like a Samsung Note 1, run it without the SIM, and you'll actually get more cell IDs that way using the Wiggle app than you would if you were to use the Wiggle app and a, a dedicated SIM, because then when you have the SIM, the mobile phone will only be looking at those cell IDs from that network provider. Um, you can also use SDRs, uh, anything from the deep digital TV adapters to Yardstick 1, Blade RF. I also, by the way, I brought the Uber Tooth and Yardstick 1, so afterwards, if you want to see what these look like, uh, I can show these to you. Uh, another requirement you need, it's, it's kind of worthless to go war roaming and not know where you are, so you really need to have a GPS to correlate all the data that you're collecting, and some way to collect that actual data besides the hardware. You need the software program, and wireless, uh, and Wi-Fi, we use uh, Kismet, and Kismet actually has a, a plug-in for Bluetooth. Uh, I do have it compiled into this particular unit here, and I'll tell you more about that. It's not the most stable thing in the world, but it does work. And GS, Heady GSM is something else I'll tell you about here shortly. Uh, that's something that I will be releasing soon. And yeah, then you need a computer to host it all. You can do it on a laptop, which is kind of big, but it works, and you have plenty of CPU power. 
or you could go something smaller like SBC, a Beagle Bone. I use Raspberry Pis, uh, but you could even I've I've seen people projects to to go Wi-Fi war roaming with an Arduino computer, and it works. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, my and part of what I'm really here to talk to you about is to try to push you into these directions, whether you want to use an Arduino Beagle Bone or or, or, or Raspberry Pi. Uh, this is just a quick a little bit assessment uh, overview of, of how I got started. As I mentioned, I got kind of started around 2002 to 2004. Uh, 2000 and, uh, at the end of 2004 was really interesting because as we were getting really into it, while I was at Dutch Town uh, in Orange, uh, which were basically the same company, we just did a name, name change. One day for lunch, I went over to the Bankastrop, which is where they have some of the embassies in The Hague. And they also have a bunch of cafes and whatnot. And I've been over there having lunch one day. I took my laptop, all with the wireless gear. While I was sitting there by myself having lunch, I noticed that the, there was one particular embassy that had the Wi-Fi, and it was definitely an internal network. It was wide open with no security at all. So I took one of my security colleagues the next day, and I said, oh, you got to see this. you got to see what's, you know, we're not breaking. We're just, it's open. <laughs> so for all we know, it could be an open hotspot. So I, I went to go show him this. And when we got there and I opened my laptop, right at the top of Kismet, says, it comes across and says, Orange, CXO Beamer. And it's wide open. And so we log on to it, and we're like, okay, what the hell is this? And we're just like, so then we go and get the extra software, because you had to have some extra software installed, so then you could make this connection and see what was being sent across it. And we realized they're sending a, right that moment, they're sending a presentation, doing a presentation in the, the executive penthouse, and, and there had already been some issues with executive decisions that were leaking out. So we went running back across that was all fixed up, uh, but then in the next year, I had a senior manager who said we wanted to put Wi-Fi in the internal network at Orange, together with hotspots for customers. Which I was like, you've got to be insane. So I made it, and, but he said T-Mobile had done it, and they wouldn't have done it unless they could have figured out how to do it correctly. Uh, long story short, to settle this, I made a bet with the, the, the managing director. They've either done it wrong, <laughs> Or maybe they do have a solution. Maybe they figured out some way to, solution, to solve some of the security issues. But the bet was I would go war room them and let's see what we find out and we'll come back and take a decision. We ended up, we found out, I, I, wore, I walked all the way to their new premises and they had just finished this construction of the building and they did not even have the turnstile gate for physical restriction into the atrium. So I just walked in, and I still had the laptop, and I had I had modified the sounds on it, so it made like a Geiger counter sound whenever it picked up my phone. <laughs> and I took that big white antenna that was in the picture, which was actually an antenna mod especially made for uh, cell phones. It was made by a Dutch company here. And it was all weather, but it, it was nice, big, impressive, big white stick. I go in there, and I'm like waving this thing around in the atrium. My backpack's making all these noises. A couple of people came up to me, and they were like, Sir, can we help you with something? I said, no, I'm from, I'm from uh, wireless engineering. I'm just doing a quick wireless survey. Oh, okay. Have a nice last note if you need any help. Okay, sure. Walked all the way around. After about 30 minutes, I didn't, I didn't dare go upstairs, but I thought after about 30 minutes, we'd push my luck. Let's get out before people start coming back saying I shouldn't be here. War roamed around the perimeter and, and noticed something. I realized, oh, this is an SMSC. An SMSC is a switch where all your SMSs at the telco site go through, and I could, I could touch it from the Wi-Fi, from this hotspot network that they rolled out. So I kind of, I was like, we can't, you know, even though they're our competition, we, I went back to the office like, we have to tell them. <laughs> we can't just let them what they're asking you now. But we didn't have any contacts. At the time, there was no uh, ORTO or any sort of independent organization that we could communicate this through. So I went over to Fraud and said, you know, hey, could you, you have contacts there, could you let them know of this issue? And I wrote out all the details. I got this fax back from their fraud department saying, and I still have this, by the way. It's like, uh, thank you very, very, very much. Uh, it was just a test system. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> sure, it's a test system now. <laughs> 
Uh, let's see. Oh, and then in 2008, T-Mobile bought Orange. <laughs> so I walk into the security team, and the physical security team looks at me, and they go, we remember you. We still have video from when you visited us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so thankful I did everything right and by the book then. Because that, that could have really come back, but they were, they were appreciative. I didn't, I didn't get any grief over that. Uh, 2009, I got really serious about cycling. I finally embergered, but at that point, thought, okay, let's give up the car and start cycling. Um, and I thought, well, let's take a laptop with us. Uh, at this point, I'm still anonymously reporting to doing anonymous uploads because I thought, well, I don't know, I don't know these guys from Wigo too well. I don't know how well they're securing. I don't want to give up my own privacy. <laughs> Uh, oh yeah, and then in 2010, that was sort of a dream job. I got the assessment to do a security assessment that was cabining and then rolled out an uh, independent Wi-Fi network at the beach. So I got to go hang out at the beach for about six weeks just doing Wi-Fi assessments up and down the beach. It was a really tough job. <laughs> <laughs> Someone had to do that. Uh, 2011, I had some of the colleagues, some of my colleagues came up to me. They knew I was into the wireless stuff. They come up to me and say, hey, Wiggle just announced they released a mobile app, and now we can play too. Uh, so we all joined, and, and you should, we created a team, Kevin, you should join our team. And I'm like, yeah, okay, we'll do this. So, uh, yes, and, and at the end of the year, I've, I've actually joined their team, and I've got my little phone, and I'm, I'm, I'm doing napping stuff out because the phone, I figured, well, that will fit on my bike, kind of because I had a nice little mount for my Android phone on my bicycle. Thought that that'll be easy peasy. But at the end of 2011, I, I get this idea. One, because the, the phone's not picking up near the Wi Fi I used to see with my laptop. And two, I had this crazy idea that I, as, a, as a Texan here in the Netherlands, I've been here for more than a decade, but at the same time, it's like, you know, it's, I love it, I'm not planning on going home, but it could all, all could end tomorrow for some unknown reason. And if it were, I didn't want to have to go back to the States and somebody goes, Oh, you lived in the Hague for 10 years? Well, have you ever been to blah, 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 blah? You know, I'd be like, oh yeah, that was right behind my house, but I never went there. <laughs> so I thought, let's just do an entire tour of the Hague, and let's map it out by Wi-Fi. And so, oh yeah, that was my dream job at the beach. Uh, so yeah, my, my own city-wide war ride idea begins, and at the end of the day, after six months, I cycled 3,500 kilometers just within the city limits. Yes? Five minutes left? Wow. Okay, then I have to go really fast. Uh, uh, stupid beamer problem. Uh, yeah, so in short, this was my setup. These were some of the maps you can see. This was basically how I was plotting to go back and then fill this in a lot, a lot better. These were the, some of the maps I was making as I was going along. You can see I methodically went throughout the whole city. Some of the sites I got to see, I would when I started this, I thought it was the craziest thing ever I'd ever probably done, because just, I mean, literally, I had to cycle at a minimum of 20 kilometers every single day. Uh, some days, because I would skip a few days, my wife would just be like, oh, no, we're going away for the weekend. So then I'd end up like the, next, uh, the following, uh, the Monday after that long weekend, I'd have to cycle 60 kilometers or more to make up for the, the weekend I missed. Uh, 2011, this is what I started with. At the end of 2011, I'd only been war roaming using my mobile phone for two months. At the halfway through 2012, using a laptop and between three to five Wi Fi antennas, I'd done the entire, everything inside the borders. Uh, some extra, I actually went over to Boscop. I found out one of my colleagues was in Boscop because I rode by her house uh, five times and she thought I was stalking her. <laughs> She was like, I knew you security guys were creepy, but what the hell? <laughs> uh, 2013, I actually went on a break, and 2014, I completely stopped altogether. This was the 2013, there was no map for 2014, because I literally didn't do anything. 2015, and I, by the way, in 2000, when I started this, I, I, I bought a Raspberry Pi Model 1 to see if I could use this. I found that CPU-wise it was very underpowered. Uh, but the, the new Raspberry Pi 2B is, is what changed all of that with the four cores. Um, I realized then I could actually start doing more. And then the other thing is I quit doing the methodical, although 
you can see a little bit, I did a couple a little bit, because sometimes it's just a little bit fun to do on a nice pretty sunny day. <laughs> but on, the, on, the, on the, 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 the whole part, for the large part, from this year on, from that year on after, uh, and my map actually for now, uh, 2018, I think, I don't know if I put it, no, I didn't put it on here yet, um, is actually, yeah, it's about the same. It doesn't look as impressive as the entire city map, but I'm actually collecting about four times as many BSS IDs. And, and what changed? Why did that change? Uh, two things. One, I quit doing sort of this whole focus on the war drive mentality and started focusing on my life. I was like, I can't, I can't, I, 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 yeah, I forgot to include this picture where my cat was sticking his tongue at me because he was a small kid and we had just gone and when I started with the war roaming, project in 2012, and I didn't get to see him for six months, really, essentially, or my wife. And she was very supportive, but at the end of it, she was like, you better be done. So I said, okay, I can't keep doing that for, for much longer. Um, so, so I changed strategy, and I went to an always-on mentality strategy. Um, I'm going to skip over some of this since I only have a few minutes. Oh, yeah, so this is what, uh, by the way, I'm not knocking, if you've ever built one of these, so have I. I started off this way, there's nothing wrong with it, but is the end goal, these are kind of crap because they fall apart, the tape wears out, they come apart in the middle of your assessment. Um, the only, this is kind of cool. I like what he did using this whole layout and I thought that was kind of cool. But I, I've done there, I didn't want to do that. Again, I wanted something. It needed to be, needed to have style, needed to be splash resistant to coffee. Um, <laughs> Uh, minimum expense. I didn't want to spend a lot of money. Uh, my wife won't let me spend a lot of money. So it had to be kind of cheap uh, and extremely reliable. Um, and like I said, dedicated roaming activity has low efficiency and high overheads for, for collecting SSIDs in terms of just doing this as a general hobby. Sometimes when you're paid to do it, you have no choice. You have to go do that. But unless I'm getting paid to do it, I don't want to do those methodical zigzags and everything, it just takes too much time. So, so what I did is I embraced an always bond strategy activity. And the way I did that was by utilizing RF mod to its extreme. Uh, who, who knows what RF mod is in Wi-Fi? Have you ever heard of promiscuous mode? Okay, that's the wrong term for it, really. <laughs> We often call it this way because of Ethernet and everything else, but it's what, 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 there is actually a promiscuous mode in Wi-Fi, but it's not really the same. It's what you really, what you really want is RF mod, radio frequency monitoring mode. And this will let you see, you don't have to associate, you, you get to see everything coming across. Oh yeah, this is, if you come and look at this one just before I move down the slide, you can go to Alibaba and get these USB sticks with a little bit of fluid in here. And sometimes you can get color, and, and this is where I store all my data, just for effect, for security people when they want to look at it. What is, what's in the liquid? What's the mercury switch? <laughs> Shake it! <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so if you don't have RF mon mode, if, you, if your, your adapters are, and that's these things here, your Wi-Fi NICs, these do not support in hardware RF mode, RF mod mode, you won't get the big numbers. You need to be able to see this in this uh, promiscuous mode where it's, it can see all the packets without being associated to any network. Oops. Um, and, and this is actually how I locate DSS IDs in other countries. And this is actually, I, I, I've done some research back when I was in 2015 because I got curious, I noticed with more and more of these mobile handsets, I could literally just stand here in this room and collect ESSIDs from every one of you where your handsets have been associated with. Your phone, your mobile phone is telling my devices about what ESSIDs. When it calls out and says, hello, I'm looking for these ESSIDs, my device clearly just goes, oh, okay, that's a ESSID. It's following the right protocol. I checked with the Wiggle admins to see if this is a legitimate way to find DSSIDs. And because they say when you're using RF mon mode, they, 
as far as they're concerned, they want to try to put a, a geographical location to a BSS ID as fast as possible, as quick as possible, and to some extent as dirty as possible. So if it's coming, if it's coming from the client to an access point, for them, that's legitimate traffic. The fact that the access point is not in range, they don't really care too much about it. And the way their, the database works is that if Hans were to come along the next day, and he were to actually see the access point, he can update the re initial record I created about that access point, and he'll get, he'll get a, a little hit saying he, he updated that GPS information for that access point. Uh, but I was the one, because I was the first one to record the MAC address of the BSS ID of that access point, I'm the one who gets that credit. So this is actually how I've leveraged this to, to get the larger numbers. Uh, instead of going directly for the access points, I go for the clients, and the clients tell me about the access points they've been talking to. And then somebody else will go along and actually update the correct geographical information for that access point. On, on the same side, this is and the reason why they actually work this way is because also access points move. <coughs> One minute, okay. I'm going to skip some of this, uh, but short. If you if you work for the if you look for the uh, SSIDs from the actual mobile handsets, you'll find that you get a lot higher numbers in terms of located uh, <coughs> access points. Because one of the, oh, just just this little clarification. Uh, and this is why they do it, because Hans's phone could be, or one somebody else in here's phone could be actually sending me the BSS ID or just broadcasting it, and their AP may not be too far from this conference, and having a little bit of loosely geolocated information is better than none at all, and that's why they, they actually work this way. So I, I've leveraged it. In, in a way, I sort of say I'm gaming the system a little bit, but I'm not, I'm not the only one who's doing this. A lot of people, a lot of the hardcore wigglers are doing it this way now. Um, and the other advantage of doing this, and not on, on your mobile phone, is most phones don't offer RF mode, RF mod mode. Uh, so this is why I've gone to, to using Raspberry Pis or some other Linux type of device to, to do this together with the right, well-chosen uh, wireless network cards. Um, yeah, these are just some of my stats that I did. Uh, this was just interesting. This was last month. Uh, these are the monthly totals. You can see here, I, I collected over. These are not everything I've seen, just what had never been discovered before, and I got credit for discovery. Over 371,000 Wi-Fi access points. The second highest is at 153,000. <laughs> Uh, and 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 again this month, I actually this month that only it's we're two weeks into this month and I've actually only been out. This is my fourth time out of the house and I'm already at over a hundred thousand because um, I actually spent a lot of time working on this presentation and my customer work. And again, so so basically, I might somebody might drive by my house or they might drive by where I'm working or me walking down the street up in the Hague. And then they go home in Austria. And since I first recorded their BSS ID from their mobile phone and uploaded it, somebody eventually will follow along later and properly geolocate where that access point actually is. And it's a little hard to see, but just north where the inn is on the Netherlands, there's literally a jet trail going off this way. And that's from where people were first detected. I first detected their mobile handsets. And then they went home from their holidays. And then somebody was sitting on the phone, on the airplane, running Wiggle app. And they, <laughs> hey, updated geolocation information. <laughs> and then they uploaded. So, so now the, 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 the original reporting uh, geolocation information has been updated to reflect it was last seen in air going home to North America. And there's literally, when you zoom in, you just see this whole trail coming out of Amsterdam which is kind of funny going over the ocean. And that wasn't, that wasn't there two years ago. That's, that's all been developed. And I haven't, I haven't flown any in, any worse in that direction. Um, we're almost there. He's going to cut me off. The, I, get, this is, I have to say this, because everyone comes to me about the Raspberry Pi fields. USB cables matter. I cannot emphasize this enough. And, and the free tip of the day is Samsung USB cables rock in terms of quality. 
I have done a lot of testing on various knockoff brands and everything else. Uh, if you want really good performance on your warp roaming stuff, you've got to have USB cables. I had a discussion with Adam Laurie last night about this because he was having issues. Uh, and I pointed people to the Samsung, the, the Samsung cables and it, make, it makes a big difference. Are we running really running on? Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Just real quick, uh, I'm going to skip through some of this, I'm sorry. Uh, the one thing I wanted to say, the last thing, is I ended up building a GSM stumbler for, for Raspberry Pis or basically any Linux system. And that's this puppy here. It is not a BTS. And that's why I thought this was so interesting. If you've got old 2G, 3G, 4G dongles, I will be releasing this into open source in the next couple of months. I need to finish on my code because it's a little nasty at the moment. But I will be releasing it. I'm calling it Hedy GSM after Hedy Lamar. And it doesn't stand for uh, uh, Global System for Communication. It stands for Geolocation Special Mobile, uh, which was supposed to be with a French accent. But I'm using <laughs> standard, standard little dongles, how are you cheap dongles. And this is, just to show you the results, this, I just did this. this these are the screens, so it can actually be, it can, uh, come on. Uh, that's T-Mobile, T Vodafone, and KPN all at the same time, collecting their cell IDs. Uh, it's totally changed my numbers on the Wibble game for cell IDs. And these are all, every little box is a different cell ID. What is, this is the Vodafone network, it's Haveningham. And what's particularly interesting that we found out, which is almost stunning, is we start off on these BTSs, which are actually right up going along the path that we started up and by what it was only 15 minutes to go from one end to the other and during this that 15 minutes we were bouncing around like crazy between these BTSs and BTSs up to five five kilometers away and we couldn't figure this out so I've talked to some people some drive professional drive test engineers for GSM companies and they're telling me the both phone networks really screwed up in terms of their sector address assignment and their uh, cell neighboring rules. Because they, they, they were like, we're familiar with this problem. We've had it on our, own, on our own network, and it's a simple fix. But they probably don't know they have this problem. So if you have connectivity issues out scaping and on Vodafone, it's time to switch operators. <laughs> Uh, this will be, I'll, I hope to have this released uh, sometime by the end of summer. Uh, it's all going to be in Python. I have some more features to add and then I'll open source it, put it out there and you can download it and install it on your own machines. Uh, there's a whole lot of things to do with war roaming still out there. I, I, when I, I was really surprised nobody had done a GSM stumbler on a Raspberry Pi yet. And a bit disappointed, but now we've got a solution almost ready for that. I hope to have it out there. And yeah, stay respectful, stay lawful. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, thanks, and, and just a quick thanks. Thanks to Adam, uh, Adam Laurie, Hans for asking me to submit, and the guys from OpenCell and Wiggle because they helped make the GSM Stubbler possible, and I have support for both Wiggle and OpenCell ID. Uh, projects and this will upload automatically to them as soon as you're done with your work. And that's it. I'm sorry I had to raise the <laughs>